This year marks the 200th anniversary of his birthday. And being both a physician and a physicist, and also an enthusiast for all kinds of disciplines like music and art, he made many meaningful contributions to science and society. Hermann von Helmholtz. He invented the ophthalmoscope, an optical contraption that makes it possible to look inside the human eye, and another device to measure the speed of nerve signals. Also, he contributed to formulating the first law of thermodynamics, which of course has lost none of its importance since. Today, Germany's largest research community, the Helmholtz Association, is named after him. And it is now awarding the Helmholtz Doctoral Prize to six outstanding scientists from various disciplines, kind of in the footsteps of its interdisciplinary namesake. Now, I've had a chance to talk to the award winners, and I'd like to take you along to get to know them. Okay, let's rock and roll. So, Mahek here is working on a big challenge of our time. He's investigating the spread of metastatic cancer via our blood vessels. So, when tumor cells travel throughout the body and settle down in other places. So, previous research in our field has established endothelial cells that form blood vessels across our body to be a crucial part of the tumor microenvironment. During my PhD thesis, I wanted to study how these cells can contribute to the metastatic progression and towards the metastatic site. So what I discovered was a molecule called as LRG1, which is an endothelial specific molecule, which was abundantly present both in the lungs as well as in the circulation in the presence of a metastatic tumor. What it implies is that LRG being a secreted molecule into the blood can be therapeutically targeted. So I imagine that's the next thing you did, right? To deactivate this molecule. Uh, exactly. So, so you know, using an, an antibody which could block LRG1 and administering that to mice, we could see that mice were living longer. And this was because of reduced metastatic burden in the lungs. And mechanistically, we, we found that endothelial cell-derived LRG1 could set up a friendly uh, environment where circulating tumor cells can come and colonize and eventually form metastatic colonies and, and tumors. So basically by inactivating this molecule, you prevent its effect on its surroundings, right? And thereby you limit the possibilities that cancer cells have to settle down and grow there. That's, that's precisely what we had aimed for. At the moment, we cannot be entirely sure that blocking LRG1 can eliminate CD tumor cells. However, even keeping these CD metastatic clones in a dormant stage is clinically of extreme importance and, and, and holds an immense therapeutic potential. Now, our next winner is working on the challenge of exploring and mapping other planets and moons with teams of autonomous robots. And there's one thing that makes exploration up there a lot more difficult than here on Earth. Well, the thing is, there is no GPS on Moon or Mars. So the robots need a different way to track their location. They can only use their own sensors, such as cameras. So in a typical exploration setting, robots operating there would start at a known reference location, such as a lander, and then start moving out. And the further they get, the more uh, their uncertainty about their position increases. And while this is already challenging for a single robot, you can imagine it's even more so for teams of robots, because they also need to exchange their maps and then even agree on where they are in them. So in my work, I developed novel methods for distributed local and decentralized global estimation of the robot's maps and poses. So with that, the robots do not need to share all of their observations, but only the most recent parts of their maps. And using these maps, the robots can relocalize themselves when they enter an area they have already traveled before. Also, when the robots meet, they can act as moving landmarks for each other, and thereby further decrease their uncertainty. So with all that together, um, well, it makes for the robot's exploration a lot more efficient. Now, what I really envy Martin for is that he actually got to apply and experience all of this in fieldwork on Mount Etna. So there we could test our methods in an environment that is as realistic as we could get um, without actually going to the moon. And I'm really excited about being able to do that again in summer next year within the Helmholtz Project Arches. For so many things in life, we need light. It comes in different colors and intensities and wavelengths and temperatures. 
And for some things, we need light to be so specific, we have to create it in a synchrotron, a particle accelerator. Now, it sends packages of electrons spinning on a nearly circular path. And every time they get deflected by the magnetic field, they emit bursts of light that fly off out in the direction of travel, where they can be used for various scientific applications. And of course, the length of these electron bunches, so the package where the electrons are put together, plays a role in what light they emit and how much. And one part is, for example, if you have a really short electron bunch, then um, they emit more light in a certain wavelength. I can show you that. Yes. So what you see here is like a short electron bunch and a long one, and they emit the same wavelength. And for the short one, they're in phase, these waves. And so they add up and you have this amplification of the light which is emitted. And directly this amplification leads to a really interesting effect because due to the amplification they interact with each other, the electrons in one bunch. And this interaction leads to a deformation. And this deformation again of the electron bunch leads to more light being emitted. And with that you get a cycle which is directly the instability which I studied. And I measured it by looking at the light and seeing how it's fluctuating. And then I changed some parameters and saw the changes in the fluctuation and with that I got an insight into the instability. And what I actually did was come up with a new measurement method, which is called a snapshot measurement, which allows us to, to take a measurement instead of over several hours in just one second. And with that I could really speed up the process and do a huge study over different parameters and understand the instability to its core, so to say. Another thing we could do with a more detailed understanding of is how Arctic sea ice behaves and develops. So sea ice basically consists of small flows. So the sea ice cover is an agglomerate of smaller pieces of ice. And so far in sea ice models and climate models, this is not the case. So sea ice is one big piece there. This is basically due to the coarse resolution of older models. And it means that many interesting effects aren't really being taken into account properly. Like, for instance, the exchange of heat or water vapor uh, between the ocean and the air through cracks in the ice. So what I did in my PhD is I wanted to investigate how can we basically break the ice in a climate model. So what we did is we increased the resolution quite drastically to an orders of one kilometer. And then basically we are able to resolve small features. So my ice cover is now fracturing into smaller pieces. And with that, then the second question arised, or the second challenge, which was, how can I evaluate now this deformation behavior that I have in my simulation? Is it realistic or not? And therefore, I needed to develop algorithms that are able to detect and track deformation features, and then I could compare statistics of those. So comparing areas where we have more fracture lines or comparing how long does a lead, for example, stay open. And by doing so, I find quite well agreement between the satellite observation and my simulations. So saying the deformation behavior in the model is realistic. And this opens then the door for further applications. So we can use now this kind of models to improve our sea ice forecast in regional scale, where it's quite important to have uh, deformation in it as well. And on the other side, we can also now use those kind of simulations also in coupled climate simulations and thereby directly resolving a lot of small-scale interaction processes that are taking place between the ocean, the ice and the atmosphere to improve our understanding of the Arctic climate. Another big challenge of our time lies in the field of data science, more specifically big data. For example, how can you learn and gain insights from huge sets of data of which you're not entirely sure how the individual parts of it are connected? So uh, in my case, I was working with uh, data from the bioelectric power plant at KIT in Karlsruhe. It's a complex plant that uh, basically turns biomass into biogas. And we wanted to find out under what physical condition the reactor in the plant may release carbon monoxide, which is a, a toxic gas. And now this is difficult because, yes, we had data from uh, all the sensors but uh, it is high dimensional. There are simply too many uh, sensors. And so what this means is that the, the patterns of say the relationships of interest hides uh, in this large amount of data. So my first step was to develop an algorithm in order to estimate dependency very efficiently in high dimensional data streams. So for instance, you could detect the dependencies between uh, pressure or a temperature sensor 
just, just an example. Once we can detect those um, dependencies efficiently, I developed a technique in order to keep track of those high correlation, uh, say, uh, depend highly correlated dependencies over time. So with this, we found that we can better find patterns and outliers uh, in such data. So for instance, um, we, can, we can find connections between sensors which we, we were not aware of, and we can find, say, uh, anomalies. So basically, you developed a method for finding patterns in, in huge sets of data, in streams of data, and learn things about the system that otherwise realistically would have been impossible to know, right? Uh, yes, that's the uh, even shorter summary, uh, I guess. Our final winner is working on the fusion reactor Wendelstein 7X. It's a large-scale experiment to achieve nuclear fusion, a concept that someday may be used for power generation. The peculiarity of Anderson is uh, its shape, uh, which is basically this. Um, this is the plasma shape, but we build the machine around the plasma, so the vacuum vessel containing the plasma is very similar in a shape. The basic idea is to fill this vacuum chamber with hydrogen isotopes and to achieve fusion by heating them under pressure to plasma. Now, the plasma is kept in place by magnetic fields, and only neutrons that carry much of the energy can escape. However, helium, a charged byproduct of fusion, can't, so it needs to be extracted through some kind of exhaust. The way to do so is uh, to intersect the magnetic field um, with some actually solid targets. In this way, we end up with what we call the open magnetic field lines, and these open magnetic field lines are the channels that we can use to transport then the particle outside the machine. This exhaust is what they call a diverter, and to examine its effectiveness, Valeria developed a camera-based diagnostic system. I used a bunch of optics to create some interference patterns uh, with the incoming light from the plasma. Then I could measure the velocities of the particles thanks to the Doppler effect. And uh, by measuring the velocity of the particle, I can actually have a direct view on these uh, transport channels uh, going from the plasma to the, uh, to the pumps for the exhaust. The interesting bit was that it was the very first time that with a camera diagnostic, we could actually picture these channels for transporting the particles out of the plasma. Then the next steps will be like, okay, there are these channels, we expected them to be there, we can now see them, are they good? Do they behave as we want them to behave and so on? But that's obviously future work. And when it comes to future work, I mean, you know how it is. For every question answered, many new ones appear. So there's always enough to be done. And in the hands of these guys, I'm convinced it's going to be good. So Mahek, Valeria, Niels, Eduard, Martin and Miriam, congratulations on winning the Helmholtz Doctoral Prize. Yeah.